Welcome back, pet parent. So one of the things that I feel like I don't talk about nearly enough, and I think part of that is because I feel very privileged to even have this conversation, but the reality is that we need to be having this conversation now more than ever because... I feel like we can still do something about it now. And if we don't talk about it, there may come a time when we can't reverse course. So I, I want to talk about it more. And that is the care that our animals raised for food get. There's so many reasons. I have not been shy about the fact that I was a vegetarian for almost 15 years of my life. And Most of that was because I just have such a bleeding heart for animals. And I didn't know what else to do at the time to feel like I was making a difference in the care of animals and protecting animals. So I felt like pulling myself out of the system would help. And the reality is that it it doesn't help. And as I've grown and as I have educated myself more, I actually understand that for me, how I feel about it, the best way to go about making change is by putting your dollars towards what you feel is right. And for me, that is regenerative ranching and farming. It was really interesting. I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago and they were like, if you could have a mad, if I gave you a magic wand right now and you could only do one thing, what would you do? And my answer was I would unwind all the subsidies for industrial farming and ranching practices and move them over to regenerative farming and ranching practices because I feel like not only is that going to give a better life to those animals that we are raising for food, but what ultimately ends up happening is that we are no longer depleting our soils and the food that we eat actually is nutritious again and kind of just goes down the ladder. It's, it's very much like trickle down. And then our pets also get better food because the animals we're raising are healthier and more nutritious and the plants we're raising growing are healthier and more nutritious. I am very excited to bring a guest back on today's episode. Before I introduce her, I just want to re- remind you, or if you happen to be new here, this is the first time you're hearing me. My name is Jessica. I am a certified canine nutritionist, a holistic pet health coach, and a positive reinforcement dog trainer. And for the very first time, I'm going to tell you, I actually now have dual certifications. I just got my certification through Billinghurst um, Institute for his raw nutrition certification. So I'm really, really excited about that because it's really the first course I've ever taken that did a deep dive into feline nutrition as well, which was something that I'm very, very passionate about being a cat mom. So this podcast that you're listening to, we talk about all things holistic health, uh, nutrition, even positive reinforcement training, because I believe that we should be looking at ourselves and our at our animals as a whole being and not just cherry picking things that we want to, to, to improve and be concerned about. So with that, I'm so excited to bring back on today's episode of the Pet Parenting Reset, Hana from Evermore Pet Foods. Thank you so much for being here, Hana. Thank you so much for having me back, Jessica. I'm always happy to talk to you about all things pet. Yes. And so your food, the food line that you make is very different to me. We talked about it before on your last episode. So if you haven't listened to that episode, please go back and listen to it. We'll just do like a quick refresher because the story was so interesting. I don't necessarily want you to repeat the story behind it, but um, it is gently cooked. It's sous vide, which is different. I, I think very different from what else is in the market. Very, for me, I feel very high quality nutrition for our pets. So can you just do like a quick, what's your like elevator pitch? Our elevator one? pitch. Um, okay. So my elevator pitch here is that, you know, this is a very busy populated space now of gently cooked foods. We've been doing this since 2009. We, I believe, coined the term gently cooked, should have trademarked it. Uh, What really separates us from the pack is our ingredient quality and sourcing. So, you know, we make this food because we love animals. We love our pets, but we love all animals. So for us, it is truly important that the farmed animals that go into our food live lives where they can express their natural behaviors as much as possible, right? We do live in this very industrialized food system and We see our brand not just as a brand making dog food, but as a platform to build awareness around the quality of the ingredients. 
So I guess that didn't even get 100% into the food, but that's sort of my, my high level. Yeah, no. Well, and so one of the things that I just, I don't think we talk about enough and probably because there are really, when we look at the big picture, there are so few of us compared to, you know, the population and, and the food supply in general is that as somebody who actually creates custom recipes for individual animals, one of the things that I kind of battle with all the time is the nutrients that are in any given piece of food. They're going to vary regardless, like from one cow to the next cow, from one piece of spinach to the next piece of spinach. Like it's, it all varies and that's normal. I think people, one, don't really understand that and don't feel like that should be a thing, but it is a thing. And I always, always tell people like, I want you to do the absolute best you can and try to under and try to educate individuals on choosing animals that are either regeneratively raised or at least if, you know, if we're not shopping at a farmer's market, if we are only shopping at a grocery store, like let's look for terms on package, like trying to educate people for looking at terms on packaging. So not just grass fed, but grass fed, grass finished, um, and educating on like the differences in how chickens are raised, whether we're looking at an egg carton or a package of chicken meat. And I know we're going to get kind of a little down and dirty on chickens (laughs) in this episode, because that's the reason why you're here. And the nutrient profiles from, say, an industrially raised chicken to a chicken that is raised on a farm where they get to spend as much time as they want outside, they're eating whatever is in the grass, they're being fed, you know, berries, and they eat the worms and all the the bugs and all the things. Like, those nutrient profiles are so vastly different. And it's also not inexpensive to (laughs) run the test to, like, get the nutrient profiles for for foods. So, um, I mean, kudos to you guys for all that you do. Well, thank you. And you probably saw it like, or you didn't see it because you were talking, but I definitely made a bit of an eye roll when we were talking about labels on packaging because they really do their hardest to be as confusing as possible. But yeah, we do do a lot of testing. We actually, on every single batch we run, we don't just do pathogens, but we do a mineral panel that gives us kind of like all of the main minerals that you'd be looking for, you know, like iron, like sodium, just minerals. I can't list off the thing from hand zinc, but that allows us, we get do get to see differences in the different ingredients that we use. And we also do omega panels periodically just to stop check. And you can see really big, honestly, where we've seen the most differences is grass-fed beef from, you know, we always use really great beef, but we went from um, you know, it was grain finished. It was like Nyman Ranch back in the day. Um, when we switched over to 100% grass fed, we saw a huge difference there. We saw a really huge difference with eggs. We actually had to supplement for choline very early on. And when we switched to fully pastured eggs, like the difference was day and night. Um, for the chicken itself, where we're noticing the really big difference. There is like some difference in minerals, but the biggest difference that we're seeing is the animals are so much leaner that we shift to using more dark meat. So we're getting so much more nutrient density there just from like being using less breast meat and more dark meat. I think overall there are more differences, but that's what's really moving the tile the most just uh, from from our testing at least. Yeah, and I know this is so like rudimentary, but it's stuck in my brain from like, I don't know what biology class I took growing up. But I remember I had a teacher that taught that like dark meat is dark because it has, and I could actually be wrong about this, but they were like dark meat is darker because it has more more mitochondria in the cells. And that's where all of the energy sources are coming from. And it is more nutritious because of that as well. And so I've always gravitated to dark meat when I eat. Yeah, I do too. Reason. I don't know. I, you know, I didn't know that bit about the mitochondria, but I do. Dark meat is just, it is more nutritious. And that's actually a really nice segue to talk about chicken uh, because, you know, one of the biggest problems with chicken in this country is that the American preference for breast meat, for white meat, has 
develop this demand for breeding birds with like bigger and bigger and bigger chickens. The contemporary broiler chicken, right? Broiler chickens are birds that we eat for meat. Um, they have to be slaughtered at around 45 days because if they get any older, they're pretty much all going to go into cardiac arrest or, you know, even they'll break legs. They have so many injuries. So the birds that most of us are eating, even farmer's market birds, like even the most common broiler birds are uh, mostly Carnish cross or Carnish cross variants, that's the breed. Um, they are just not functional animals. And it's really heartbreaking. You can even have birds of this breed raised in high welfare conditions, but they are intrinsically suffering based on their breeding. Yeah, I think I've, I intentionally don't watch videos like this. <laughs> like I truly, I am that kind of person that like, even if I scroll, scroll past something on social media, I can't, I can't handle it. I will tear up and cry. I have literally been like in a deep sleep, taking a nap on the couch and somebody is watching TV and that like ASPCA commercial comes on and I literally will wake up crying because I hear the song and I just, you know, we equate it to what we know we've seen on the TV commercials with, you know, the suffering dogs and cats. And oh, the all Sarah McLachlan, the Ars of yeah. the Angel. <laughs> I think we, there's a generation of people who are traumatized by that song. I'm in that generation of people who are yeah, traumatized by that song. And it just, I, I have to, for my own mental health, not watch that kind of thing. But I have heard that these chickens are so, like, they, they can't even hold themselves up. Yeah. It's... Right. Like, they're falling over. And that is, I mean, it's disgusting to me. I understand why they're doing it, but I don't feel like it's right. And I don't want to support that, but I also don't know how to not support that. You know, like, and I think that's how a lot of people feel that, okay, all of this is going on, but they don't know what to do about it. So they just ignore it. Yeah. It's like the problem is so big, right? It's like, it where is. do I even start? Um, which sounds like your like journey with vegetarianism as well. Um, well, a good place to start with chicken. This is where I get to, you know, crow about things a little bit. There is this initiative called the Better Chicken Commitment. It's a, a collaboration between 11 animal welfare organizations internationally. And the idea behind it is to sort of create a common set of welfare standards that are sort of the bare minimum that broiler chickens should be raised to and you, major corporations have seen this like i think it's more than 200 brands now how much they follow through of it of course that's like a whole different story but basically it has five different components and, and you know the first component is ro like room the amount of stocking density space that they have and stocking density is a weird thing you know you see these these pictures of these giant barns that you don't look at where the chickens are like, you know, they're basically, it's just a ball of chicken. There's no floor space. Basically, the better chicken commitment and all the certified humane bodies, what you're going to see is the stocking density of six pounds per square foot. And that would be considered humane. And what that basically means is there's one square foot of farm space for every six pound of chicken, which still sounds pretty freaking dense to me. Yeah. And that's like, like that is, that is high welfare chicken, right? Even even chicken that you're getting that's certified humane, you know, these type, you know, that is kind of, that's like the maximum. So there are operations, obviously, that have more density. But the bottom line is, if, if you are a farmer raising chicken for food, you know, you do have to operate at a certain level of scale and efficiency, right? I mean, it's sad, but that's reality. But that's, that, that those sort of animal welfare standards, the idea of the better chicken commitment is it should be across the board. Um, in today's industrialized farming, you will have often the stocking density could be like 11 pounds of chicken per square foot. So like they're packed together, they can't move. Um, so that's yeah. component number one. And feel free to interrupt me with questions whenever you want, because I'm going to spiel. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just like, I can see that in my head because I've obviously seen things on TV and on social media. I can see in my head, like how crowded it is. But it also makes me think, just because I like to throw stories in, I have such a hard time walking through in markets because I literally, like that, I'm, when you said that, I'm also seeing a picture of a lobster tank at an Asian market. And I'm like, I can't, 
I can't. Yeah. I'm like walking I mean, by, like, I can't. I can't no, look at should this. live like that, right? Yes. It bothers me so much. And so I'm glad that, I mean, it may not be perfect, but it's a start. And so, yeah, keep telling me so about that's this better chicken commitment. Um, so that's uh, so that's component one is the space. Component number two, as a trainer, this is a term you will be familiar with, enrichment. So basically just the idea that these birds have these enrichment features in their space so they can have natural behaviors. Now, what enrichment generally look like for chickens is like bales of hay that they can jump up on, purchase, like posts for them to perch on, like um our, our place will have like branches of eucalyptus suspended from the ceilings that they can peck at. So those are the sort of enrichments that we're talking about for chickens. Um, then there is something called it's slaughter, right? Nobody wants to talk about this part, um, could, but it's a process called controlled atmosphere stunning as the slaughter standard in, in the U.S. and much of the world. Uh, the slaughter method, and you can you can put your hands over your ears, Jessica, if you don't want to hear about this. The slaughter method that's used is something called live shackle slaughter, where basically these the birds are gathered by workers. They're shackled upside down in these metal shackles um, on a conveyor belt. Their legs can break in the process. They're, they can flap their wings. Those can break in the process. Then they're conveyed through an electrified water bath that stuns them. Uh, so, and then in your face, I don't want you to keep going. Then they're on like a conveyor belt that like where there's a mechanical blade that cut off their head. And then they get like dragged through a bath of boiling water that loosens their feathers for de-feathering. Now at any point in this process, there can be a failure. So they can kind of flap around and not get into the bath or, you know, into the electric bath. They can miss the blade. So that leaves them getting like dragged through boiling water alive, right? That's a pretty horrible way to die. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't yeah. wish that on my worst enemy. Um, so the alternative that's through the better chicken commitment is something called controlled atmosphere stunning. In this case, the chickens and the crate that they're transported in, they never leave, they're never handled. They go through a tunnel where CO2, it can be, it can be a couple of yeses, but CO2 is the most common is entered into the atmosphere so they fall asleep it's an irreversible stun um and then they go through the slaughter line but that's a much more much more humane set of circumstances i would so yeah, yeah that's that's the that's the it's a more extensive process for sure which is why a lot of buy-in hasn't happened yet but. for sure and the other thing that i think people don't talk about enough is not just the welfare of the animal to me that is incredibly important and I think if you ask most people, point blank, most people are going to admit that it is important to them too. They just don't have the capacity to think about it very often. But the other thing that I have learned about, because there are, and I don't know how prevalent this is anymore, it probably still is in some places, but I think it was for quite a while in like certain Asian countries where they thought that the more trauma the animal went through like it made the meat taste better kind of thing so I remember reading about that many many years ago and I think I'm sure like you know people have become more civilized and it doesn't happen as often but I think what we have learned is the exact opposite mm -hmm. as the far opposite. as like nutrition yeah. is well and true. also for taste like we know that animals that are traumatized less actually taste better um that's that's something we know now yeah yeah, and I mean, first of all, it's just a horrible thing to think about. It's a really horrible thing to think I, about. I thought you were going to get to the, the welfare of the people working the line, too, because it's also mess, much less traumatic for the human workers, which, I mean, let's be honest, like, meat processing jobs are, like, the lowest paid and most dangerous and dehumanizing work. So if uh, reducing the stress on the animals also reduces the stress on the people working with the animals so um that's actually a huge part of it well yeah i i have heard have heard about that too and i can imagine that it completely desensitizes you as a human yeah no it's it's gotta be yeah i i couldn't imagine so the next step and i'm actually saving a step that's technically earlier for last because i think it's the most interesting so okay. um outside auditing to make sure that you're actually that you're actually getting something from a supply chain that does 
follow the practices that you're supposed to be right like it's one thing to be like yeah we're doing this <laughs> and it's another thing to have a third party like certification board to so that's important the last one and the one that we just finally finally were able to make happen and it's something we've been trying to do for years is the breed component having a higher welfare breed where you know it's a chicken with a normal size breast it looks like a normal bird they're active they can have healthy lives on you know so and that's that's actually it's been really hard for us we have been trying for like nearly a decade to get higher welfare and are pastured too so we've been trying to get pastured high welfare birds for like the longest time and we've had free range they go outside but they weren't this high welfare breed and they weren't like full-on pastured so this is huge for us um Yay. and these breeds like these birds we just it, i say just it's, it's been a little while now but we went out to visit mary's chicken which is where we get our chicken from and it was so cool seeing these birds running around they have a pasture it's actually regenerative so there's like cover crops and they were in the the process of shifting over and we were out there so they were like planting all these trees so we have videos on our website like I wrote a whole blog about it but these birds they're just like running around outside pecking at bugs it's just really cool to be like okay we know you have a short life but you're living your best chicken life they had unrestricted access to run inside and outside so even though we walked in it was like yeah that's still a lot of birds but when it's it, it's staggering walking into a chicken barn like they, they stocked to like a five and a half pound density i think but you know there was still a ton of room because they were like right, running inside and outside as much oh. as they wanted and um, it was just really interesting to see that and the whole the whole process like we saw an entire chicken's life cycle from egg to barbecue in the span of a few hours it was mind-blowing yeah, so. I bet. And probably kind of fills you up a little bit to get you through some of the harder things in life to see. Yeah, to see oh, something I, so cool. I think, honestly, I think everyone who eats meat should have to, like, see how the animals are raised and go to a meat processing plant, which was, I mean, the scale of that was staggering. Um, we, you know, Mary's, they're not, you know, they're not a mom and pop farm, but they're not Tyson. You know, they're like, uh, so they're not Tyson, but they were like, the scale was staggering just how many birds are like on this conveyor belt getting broken down by workers so yeah it's just yeah. it's really like it's literally seeing how the sausage is made but i think yeah. it is really important as companies that we visit our suppliers and really see how things are done um one thing i will say though is it really bought into high relief the claims that are out there for me like um just in terms of I think when people are getting certified humane chicken or they're getting stuff where people are saying free range, high welfare, they have this image in their head of like the little house on the prairie with like a little barnyard with like backyard chickens. And that's not what it's like. We yeah. literally have the highest welfare chicken in any commercially prepared food for pets or humans. We were the first company of a commercially prepared food for pets or humans to meet the better chicken commitment like wow you will not find anyone using chicken like above our level in a prepared food so and even even that like it was staggering to me that, like just there is nothing that's going to meet your vision what high welfare chicken looks like and you know every every time i go to a conference or see a speaker they're always saying like oh you should get pastured chicken you should get you know high welfare animals and i don't the stuff that is truly high welfare is really 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 hard to get like even your local farmers market like those are still chickens being raised in chicken bark you know and i just yeah. think i think some of us have unrealistic perspectives of what high welfare looks like well it's a whole different ballgame when we're like talking about cows and sheep. Like they have it much better. Chickens, uh, chickens have it hard. We eat nine billion of them a year in the U.S. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I actually am like I used to eat a lot more chicken than I do now. And I think that's part of it for me is that the more I learn and the more I learn about the standards and what I actually want on my plate, I'm, I just gravitate less and less toward chicken for that reason even though it is 
it's much more easily accessible, cheaper. I mean, we look at the price of beef today, but I'm, um, you know, Please. Don't get me started on feed prices. We've like just been through this whole finding a new vendor process. It's, oh my gosh, I'm feed sorry. prices are insane. But it's yeah, I actually I have a harder time eating red meat or eating eating chicken, and for a lot of reasons, most fish, than I do eating red meat that I know is like well raised because for for that reason. Um, yeah. Well, and I happen to live in Texas, so I do have. I mean, let's be real. For human consumption, there are really amazing ranches around the country that will ship anywhere. But being that I live in Texas, I also have access to local ranches that I can look and see, okay, they meet all of these practices that I'm looking for, or they're pretty close or whatever. And so I, I do eat a lot more red meat now than I ever have. I also feel healthier now than I ever have, but that's that's a whole other story. <laughs> You're in cattle country. I am. So uh, I do want to back and talk about claims a little bit that people yeah. do put on their labels. And before I go even much further in this, I just want to say to everyone, like, if you're feeding your dog fresh food, even if you're not living up to these very yeah. high standards, you're you're doing great by your dog. Um, or even oh, if you're yeah. interested in learning about this, like, don't feel bad about what you're doing. You know, if you're feeding fresh or learning about feeding fresh, because I feel like when I go on to these, like, and this happens and this happens, like, I don't want people to feel bad about what they're doing. I just want to educate people. So, yeah, yeah, I would much rather, and I, I do want to talk about label claims. I was actually just, just today, read through the PER Act because being at the AFCO meeting this in August, it's a big deal. And nobody really knows what's going to happen, but there's, there's a lot going on. And so, The label claims that they allow are insane, just in pet food. Like, let's not even talk about human food. It's insane what they allow on labeling and what they allow in in ingredients. And oh my goodness gracious. But yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. Let's just talk about label claims. (laughs) So my favorite, I'll just start with the most egregious. This one actually really pisses me off whenever I see it. Cage free chicken. Just that every, all of the chicken that we eat in the US, every broiler chicken, we do not raise those in cages. Those are cage free. So if you are buying chicken at the supermarket, it is cage free chicken. If you are buying chicken that is in pet food, it is cage free chicken. If somebody decides to put cage free on a label, it just means this is like the worst factory farm chicken you can buy because we have nothing else to say about it. Well, and they all say like antibiotic free, hormone free too. And it's yep. like, well, that's that's also mandated. You're not doing anything special. Well, antibiotics, they can take antibiotics actually. The hormones are the mandated. And if you Got look it. so yeah, I mean actually they give they give chicken a lot of antibiotics because they come so close. Oh. Um, but the hormones so you can use hormones in, in red meats, but all all avian products is federally prohibited to use hormones and in if you do put hormone free on a label, you can say it, but in this like tiny print somewhere else on the label, you have to point out that federal law prohibits the use of hormones because they just assume people don't read the small print, right? Yeah. Well, most people don't. I most mean, people don't. yeah, I could get, I, I mean, we all, we all like accept the terms and conditions when we, when yeah. we get apps without actually reading them. 100 percent right like how many yeah. how many apps do we have on our phone that like we have no idea like what we've agreed to yeah, yeah. so yeah um they just so listen those, to us all the time those are the two worst claims but then the other one is humanely raised right and like yeah. we see this on our packaging too because frankly actually i don't know if we do it anymore. there's like very there's limited language to describe things right so you okay. can have really great food and a really terrible food making the same point with the same word But it doesn't really mean anything, right? So if you put humanely raised on your package, all you have to do is list the features that make you think it's humanely raised. Um, Which is why a lot of the times you'll see like vegetarian feed, like no crates, like whatever. Like it doesn't mean it's humane. It just means you've decided that according to your own standards, it's humane and you're listing one of those standards. So that's a... That's a funky one, right? The vegetarian feed bothers me so much, too, because I'm like, 
first of all, I want my chickens to eat freaking everything because that's what they're designed to eat and not like just corn and soy or whatever you are saying is vegetarian feed. Like, yeah. that drives me nuts. Well, I think, well, when you think about what is actually allowed in feed yeah. for AFCO, you maybe yeah. <laughs> like walk it back and be okay with a vegetarian feed. But yeah, chickens should be eating bugs. They should be eating grubs. I remember, so I live around the corner from like a small chicken farm, but actually this farm, remember those mom and pop farms that I said don't exist? Um, yeah. This is kind of, I mean, they, they don't, she's an egg, it's eggs, but but uh they're free range they're very free range they're a little too free range and i remember i was walking my dog once and there was this mass of chickens in the room there were just like all of them were clumped together and i was like what are they doing i got closer and they scattered they were eating the carcass of a chicken that had been hit by i mean that's so sad but also like natural i guess yeah they're little dinosaurs i mean they are they are like the closest living relative that we know about, like chickens and I think emus to T-Rex. So, I mean, I love that little fact. They, birds do look like dinosaurs. Um, they do. They really do, especially chickens and turkeys. Well, and that, so I think, I think, was it cattle feed maybe? Like chicken feces, I think, is allowed in cattle feed, if I'm not mistaken. There's so much. There is so, like, I don't know how any one person could keep up with all the things that are allowed in regulation. I mean, I don't because I know that what we're doing is like totally above board. Like, yeah. I don't even try to. I don't even try to keep track of all the terrible stuff because I know that what we do. I'd like to say I'm not. I'm not a pet food expert. I'm an expert in food. So that's sort Got of it. that's sort of how I like to think about it. Oh, so back to label claims. So what it, I'm trying to remember. I mean, those are really the big ones. Free range. Uh, so free range really just means that the birds have access to the outside. It could be access that's at one end of like a hundred meter barn. So there are chicken, most of the chickens like they won't even see that door in their yeah. entire lifetime. And even in a situation where they do have access to their, if they're those Cornish crossbreeds, they don't go outside. In fact, they're bred to prefer being inside. So, mm. you know, even taking it, leaving apart the fact that like their chests are so big and their legs might break and all the physiology, a lot of times they won't even choose, given the option to go mm. outside. Just to stop. Um, oh. So free range is like a, can mean a lot of different things, right? Like it can mean like a bird is like healthy and has access to the outdoors, or it could mean there's like a tiny little door at the end of a hundred meter barn and no one goes outside. So the problem with a lot of these terms is that they're so ambiguous and you don't really know exactly what you're getting. So those are the chicken claims. Yeah. Well, and the idea that like humanely raised is so objective bothers me like how can we regulate so much and then not regulate it's marketing that's all it is i think i do think there's some stuff in the works i don't remember exactly what but i think that there might be somewhere usda regulation coming around that soon actually one of the big things that changed recently um and just saying this because you mentioned it at the beginning the grass-fed grass finish thing now when you make a grass-fed claim the regulations are that it has to be grass in their life. So oh, nice. that's a new change. I don't know. You know, they'll change the rules and I don't know what the implementation mm-hmm. deadline is. I don't know if it's already right. required to have been implemented or not, but like that was changed in the past few years. So, um, so grass nice. fed, you know, we still get asked and it's still going to be a question for a long time, but grass fed now yeah. does really, it is required to mean a person grass fed. That's so. nice. So right. then if it's grain finished, they just can't make the claim at all? Is I, I believe works? so. Because all, well, here's the thing. All cows with like, I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions, but like the vast, vast majority of cows, they all begin their lives on pasture with their mothers, right? This is another reason why um, cow, cattle, cow beef is intrinsically higher welfare than, than poultry because they all do start their lives on pasture and get to live out much of their lives on pasture and if they're going to go to a feedlot it's not until about six months before slaughter Um, because the real reason for this is grass is cheap you know you don't have to pay to feed a cow grass 
So yeah. Um, so even even in like the most industrialized scenarios, the cows still get to be outside for the first parts of their lives. Yeah, that's. I mean, I guess somewhat nice to know. <laughs> um, a little reassuring, but yeah, I mean, what... there is a big difference between that and re- you know regenerative ranching. So well, huge. yeah, for sure. Oh. So basically, since you have made the switch, you've been able to make the switch to chickens that are raised in much better conditions that more align with your standards for animal welfare. You have also seen changes in the nutrient profile. So you've actually been able to, could I say, improve the recipes or just... Yeah, I mean, I think the recipes are pretty damn good. I don't, and, and I just do want to clarify it. We've been working with the same supplier for the past seven years and they've been, like, it's all been like very high welfare chicken. Okay. Um, and even the Cornish Cross ones have been like, they go outside and have nice farms. But yeah, they're, they were not what we, you know, actually every aspect other than they would have been other than the breed they fully met the better chicken commitment um until until now but yeah i mean we have we have noticed a difference again it does seem to be mostly shifting around the cuts of the meat that we use to do the higher nutrient cuts um our omega ratios didn't change as much as we thought they would but they're they're pretty good um i'm being like so transparent i'm like it's better but it's not like you know it's not I but mean, we were real. also starting from a really high baseline. Like, yeah. I think if we were using, like, Tyson chicken and then mm-hmm. switching over to the Mary Step 4, I think it would have been, like, a huge difference. But because we were already starting from such a high ground to begin with, like, I don't think, I think the difference would have been a lot more noticeable if we were coming from, like, a lower starting point, if that makes sense. Yeah, Absolutely. And since you brought up omegas, that's really not something I have talked a lot about on this channel outside of like maybe Billy um, bringing it up a couple of times. But it is a very interesting thing that because so much of what we traditionally eat is very high in omega-6s, which is more inflammatory. And we have to balance that out with omega-3s. Can you like talk about what you're looking for in your omega ratios? Sure, you know, um, and you're going to have better omega ratios um, with like the grass fed cattle situation than you will poultry. Poultry, you're always going to have um, like a higher omega ratio than you will with like a well raised red meat. But we try to keep our omega ratios under five to one, which is where we are with, where you go close to that with like most of our poultry formulas. And then our lamb and beef is like closer to between two and three to one you know there's more seasonal variability in those animals um which you know inflammatory range is really like in the 10 to 1 range um with commercial foods can be as high as like 20 or 30 to 1 it's pretty crazy um and people we get a lot of questions about the omega ratios and i think a lot of people there's a lot of confusion around that and some people think all omega-6s are bad and inflammation is always bad and there's a lot of misunderstanding of the inflammatory process and so inflammation isn't a bad thing i know everyone's like oh my god inflammation is it's not a bad thing inflammation is actually what allows our bodies to heal and we do need a certain amount of omega-6s for our bodies to heal because you know inflammation comes to wounds it, it 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 gets blood throwing through wounds it recruits like immune system cells like it's very important where inflammation is a problem is when we get to chronic inflammation when your body's inflamed when it's not in response to like an actual like threat or injury or illness and that's where we have so much problems with these diets that are have these very unbalanced omega ratios yeah i think as you were saying that, I was remembering, um, I think it was Sean at Earth Buddy who was like equating it to working out. Like, we're intentionally damaging our muscles to improve our bodies. And I don't know, I don't, I, had to, I would have to go back and listen to how he explained it again. But like, that's what was popping into my head. Like, not all stress is bad stress. Like, yeah, we exactly. have to have basic yeah yeah like when you're sore that's like when they say when you're sore after working out you know it's a lot of people their tendency is to just like pop an ibuprofen and to like so it doesn't hurt so you're not sore and it's like no just suck it up and drink some water because doing this you're actually 
inhibiting your muscle healing. So that's, uh, Got that's it. where the yeah. working it out comes from. So, okay. What are, can you remind me what all of the recipes you have available at Evermore? Sure. So we have chicken, we have turkey, those are poultries, then we have beef and lamb. And our beef and lamb are 100% grass fed and they're, regen- they're raised on regenerative ranches. So super, super thrilled about those as well. Yeah. So what are some of your favorite things that you've gotten to do with selecting the ingredients? And I mean, obviously the better chicken is, is fabulous. So when you're selecting the ingredients for these recipes, what are some of the like really cool things you've been able to do and and learn and like whether it's with animal welfare or how the plants are grown what what are some of the things that you're like this is just so cool i'm glad we get to do this oh god i wish you know allison my partner she's really the one who is the i call her the sorcerer s because <laughs> she's the one who gets to talk to all the vendors and like totally nerd out um i'm sort of I'm I'm the one who gets to relay that information to the public. So I wish I had her job a little bit, but like we learned so many interesting things. Um, this is actually something really interesting and kind of sucky that we learned. You know how beef prices are like through the roof right now, like even out of pace with everything else. Yeah, I blame Bill Gates. I'm just saying. There's actually this thing called the 12 year cycle in okay. beef. And this is like far more complicated in economic terms that I'm sure I can relay but basically around every 12 years there comes a cycle where like based on like how many animals are left because of like them being like slaughtered at different times and like various cyclical and economic demand factors that the beef market is just screwed and everything gets really like really expensive and it's just like everything is out of whack and we're there right now oh my gosh yeah we're in a we're so that's crazy. Well, and I remember there were so many fires here in Texas yeah. too that were I'm imagined sure those are killed a lot things. of cattle. Yeah. yeah, there's so many, so many things um going on with beef right now. And um yeah. It's but the twelve year cycle is a part of it. So it's just it's about learning these things that you wouldn't have otherwise thought about, right? And yeah. everyone in these very specific industries have this like full world of knowledge, like seaweed, right? We work with this amazing seaweed uh, seaweed company, um, Maine Seacoast Vegetables. And there is, you know, when you have um, seaweed on a label, um, you know, it's kelp, right? You you say kelp, but there's like so many different types of kelp, right? And the kelp that we chose, like we chose for its like iodine. And it's like a lower iodine kelp. Uh, it's flatter out. But there's just like, there's so many different types and it is important even when you buy supplements, right? Like it's not necessarily going to say what it is, but there is a huge range of what seaweed can be and what it can contain. So that's mm-hmm. like one thing, just just learning about these entire worlds and these specific ingredients. And I wish my business partner were in here to like talk about it in more detail because she, you get her going on something. Like every single ingredient matters so much in our food that it becomes like an interview process with all of our vendors and like cranberries cranberries are like one of our formulas i don't even remember the details about it but it became it was like a two-week conversation about like which cranberry vendor we're gonna go with and it wasn't just about price you know there were so many little factors so i guess just getting to be exposed to different people who like their entire lives are focused on like this one ingredient blueberries you know for a while we were using wild but not organic blueberries um because they didn't really have wild organic blueberries they do now but um one of the reasons why is because they're more nutritious they have a higher anthocyanin you know the thing that makes it blue they're higher in antioxidants and they're just more healthy than cultivated blueberry or so we thought okay. we there was a shortage situation where we couldn't get wild blueberries there was just some weather thing a couple of years ago so we had to look at cultivated alternatives we learned that the smaller the berry the more nutritious it is because it's more surface area of skin to berry so when we had to buy cultivated berries 
we didn't, we got the small organic berries, which I don't even know where they sell them publicly, but we, and that's how we almost matched or pretty much matched the nutrition of the wild berries. Cause it wasn't just what's in the berry. It's like the size of it, it makes a huge difference. Cause like most fruits and vegetables, like the bulk of the nutrition was in the skin. So wow. that's a weird little fact I learned. <laughs> Well, yeah, and that's I, that's why I love talking to so many different people because I always pick up like little tidbits here and there that I'm like, I gotta save that away for a rainy day and like put all of the pieces of the puzzle together at one point. I don't know, maybe. But it's also why exactly what you just described, like every ingredient, every piece of the puzzle goes down its own little rabbit hole to all these things you can learn, the variations that are out there, what's available in the market, what you have to go searching for that, you know, may not be as uh, readily accessible, but that's what you want. That is something that, especially for the average pet parent or just the average human alive today, like we don't have that kind of bandwidth to go through and go down all of these rabbit holes to vet every single ingredient, every single thing that we're doing and bringing into our homes. Which is why having companies like Evermore that we can trust that do care and do all of these things is so important to have in the marketplace. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> thank you for recognizing it. Since I went down an ingredient rabbit hole, can I go down one more ingredient rabbit yeah. hole about like one of our least popular ingredients? Okay. Um, and it also ties back to inflammation. So one of the ingredients that we have that people get real mad about um, is we use organic sunflower oil, right? Seed oil. People freak the, I'm not going to say that word, about yeah. seed oils. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of reasons why they do, and I understand that. Um, the reason we use our organic cold-pressed sunflower oil is that we use a particular, like a high linoleic variant. So linoleic acid, which is an omega-6, um, there is like a required amount of it to have. And the most concentrated way to get it is through island lakes sunflower oil which you can't find in a grocery store or health food store like this is like a very special order item people see seed oil right it's a trend seed oils are bad and there is a lot of reasons why you know most industrial seed oils are extracted through a chemical process using hexane that's not good a lot of them are from gmo crops also not good um, and they're mostly, they're associated with like the inflammation of a Western diet. But I think what needs to be separated out, right? There's that like reflex reaction, like seed oils are bad, but like, let's think about this more. Like, let's think about context. Like where we're seeing seed oils and health problems are like in these like processed, like junk food items and like deep fryers at restaurants, right? You're not looking at like an organic version of this product used in this like very targeted way for a specific purpose. So I think it's really easy to be like, oh, this thing is bad because people who eat a lot of it have health problems. But it's like, well, that's not the whole story. So I think that for us, like we research something, we're using it for a very specific reason. So anytime you have a company and it looks great, but you see one thing that you disagree with, like just ask like, hey, why do you use um, and usually there's a reason, like no one is going to put together. And I'm speaking about other companies too, because a lot of, actually a lot of food companies do use some form of seed oil and other companies will use marketing like seed oil free. And we get asked all the time, like, oh, well, why don't you use coconut oil? Or why don't you use this seed or that seed? And it's like, the reality is, and if you wanted to get like the actual amount of linoleic acid that we need through other means, we'd be putting in like so much other oil, like. Like right now, it's like we only need the smallest fraction of our formula to be dedicated to hitting this number. So that like frees us up to use that room for things like our organic dandelion greens or those like beautiful little blueberries we spoke about. So um, that's like an example. But to get our high linoleic seed oil and sunflower oil, um, the supplier that we were using like basically stopped existing and we had to... We're doing this for the first time. We imported 
our own seed oil directly like from Germany from the supplier it's like one of like two places or three places in the world that like makes this stuff importing things internationally like not through a broker I do not recommend this for any small company <laughs> like we had no idea what we were doing like so you know we, we put in the purchase order for this stuff they're like who's your freight broker and we're like what I thought you just sent yeah. it here and there's yeah. just like all these regulations and things that you have to deal with like with importing that we had no idea about it's just like funny how you have to like learn as a small business, you just learn these things by having to deal with them. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I feel that. We, we go to great lengths to get this specific high little lake organic sapphire oil. So no hate, please. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, actually, because the last time I talked to you, that was one of the two questions that I was like, why are we using seed oil and why are we using grains? <laughs> And I, I think you answered that beautifully in the last episode as well. So please, like, go oh, back and listen to that. Did that come up in the last episode? I don't even remember. I, no, I know. Well, it's it's been a while, but yeah, I, I, miss you. I mean, <laughs> obviously, I remember because I am very much like try to learn things for myself to be able to educate others. Like that's kind of the point of everything I do is to to educate others and hopefully decrease that learning curve that I had. Like that's my goal because. I feel like my learning curve was way too big. Like I shouldn't be feeling the best I've ever felt in my life at almost 42. Like why couldn't I have done this in my 20s? But well, we're mortal in our 20s. Oh, we are. You're right. You're right. But like I I want to help people get through that learning curve so much quicker. And I truthfully that conversation that I had with you about the seed oil that you use really and I think this is true with so many people that I talk to like it made me open my mind to to the idea of something other than what I believed in and I think that is so important for all of I don't care what we're talking about what whatever product thought what you know whatever it is we're talking about like to be able to have an open mind and not be so like steadfast in your ways is so important because there is always something more to learn and there are always exceptions to rules and there's always like yeah all the like things. things that like we thought we knew but we didn't yeah. you know it's just it's it's knowledge is evolving right it's just right. we all we all have these conceptions but it could all be completely different tomorrow you know like when you think of like what medicine was in the 1800s <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I know. Oh my gosh. Like I could I could not imagine. Like though some of it I mean, people still will like put leeches on them and stuff. I was actually just thinking about leeches. I mean, they're actually really useful on uh, like wound like they'll use them in like very specific like wound situations. I mean, I yeah. don't know about like for funsies, but like for like cleaning very specific wounds, they do still use them. But um Yeah. I yeah. mean bloodletting. Bloodletting. Sure. That's the weird one. They're, yeah, the bloodletting. Yeah. I will say that, like, I used to get such bad migraines, and I don't get them as often anymore because I'm, I, I've done so much to, to, to my own for my own health. But I, I remember a time where I was in such bad pain. I was like, I understand why they just used to cut people's heads open to like relieve the pressure. Like, I'm oh, like, yeah. please do that to me right now. Like, I get it. I understand how they got there. <laughs> like, I don't know if it worked. Why they well, thought it was a good idea. Yes, I can see. I did. I obviously Wait, did what not. What was the term that. for that? I, I know, like, remember there's like a term for it. I don't remember it. Yeah, I don't know. But I can see how they got there. Oh my goodness. Well, I think we got a little bit away from pet food. But yeah, that's I think okay. we got away from pet food. We got away from like humane raising, uh, which I can always circle back to. But, uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm really excited for you to be, you know, going around and t talking to everybody now about meeting these. Well, it sounds like you are already meeting the standards, but now that yeah. there is such thing as, um, you know, what did you call it? Better chicken? It's the better chicken commitment. Um, commitment. Now that which is what you take when you're going to it's the better. I don't know what it, what we're called now that we actually fulfilled the commitment, but the Got project it. is the better chicken commitment. And it's over 200 companies. And I do have to say a lot of, there's a lot of smaller food companies in the midst doing it, which is really, you know, pet food companies lead the way so much. I think so too. I think, um, and I kind of, I feel like it's your time. Yeah, small like, pet food companies. like Small, yes, the small, like, 
closer to indie kind of ethical type, yeah it, yes I just I feel like it's it's your time I feel like like we're at this like fork in the road where it's gonna go one way or the other and like the more people we can get on board the more people that are just first of all aware that this is an option yeah um like the better because the truth is and I, I think I've already said this once where we spend our dollars is what determines the trajectory of whatever we're, whatever niche you're putting your money into like that's what determines what happens in that niche because even the biggest pet food company whether it's like a hills or a mars or whatever it is they are always looking at what is going to improve their bottom line and where people are putting their dollars is where they're going to put their energy and efforts into and I think um I know I certainly have started seeing that that they are more interested in I don't know if I necessarily want to say like fresh feeding but like the idea of healthier pets that the pet parents care about the quality of their pet's life and how healthy they actually are and because, you know, they are funding things like animal biome research yeah. and stuff or like, like that. So, Mars bought Nom Nom, you know, and well, I don't, they, I'm not going to specifically speak to their quality. It is a fresh food, yeah. you know, like, right. I mean, yeah. there's going to be a Hills fresh food. Don't get, like, it will happen. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. coming. And again, sure. like, do I think that they're going to do it as well as we do? Do I think they're going to do it even as close to as well as we do? Of course not. But like, even a Hills fresh food is going to be better than no fresh food. So yeah. the market, if the mass market is getting nudged in that direction, well, I'm still going to sit here and be like, well, it's not what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and I'd be annoyed by it. But at the end of the day, our pets are winning. Exactly. And um, I think the more we as consumers push it in that direction, the more these larger pet food companies see that and start moving in that direction also is going to have to change the education that they're giving to veterinarians because if they're putting out a fresh food product they're going to have to re-educate their veterinarians yeah. that it's okay yeah. and that's a good thing too i don't know how i got down that road but... i think that that's i mean i think that that's a more relevant road than the sapphire oil detour so uh... it's okay it's, it's it's a question people have i mean obviously yeah. you know you see it people are asking you all the time and and i get it i mean i I do my best to try to avoid much seed oils in my diet. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's on near impossible, just how we live today. But we just do the best we can, and um, we, well, you as a pet food company have to meet these crazy standards that that AFCO decided on, however long ago, to meet minimums based on synthetics. But you still got to meet them, and that's a whole other story. Yeah. And then and, and maximums aren't there or in some places yeah. where they should be. Yeah, it's it's wild. Like those profiles are wild. Um, and I'd love to see what it would look like if all of that research were done with fresh food. Yes, I agree. So I think with that, let's just let's just wrap this up. Say I'm going to say another congratulations to you for once again leading the way. Thank you. From the fresh food, pet food community because you've been around for so long doing a gently cooked and now um, you're kind of leading the way with standards of care for the animals we use as as food as well and i appreciate that so much thank you and thank you so much for having me on again thank you all right guys have a fabulous rest of your day i'm so glad you were here to listen to this incredible talk from hana and i do hope you would check out evermore pet food which is evermorepetfood.com yep you got it Perfect. All right, guys, have a great day. Give your pets some extra love from me and Hannah today.